On some of the highest floors, the inferno and the smoke fueled a panic that led some to the windows, where they were either blown out or chose to fall. I've seen at least 12 people jump to either jump or, or they had no, no choice. I don't know if it was by force. They didn't want to get burned or they didn't want to blow up, but they just jumped. And just look at them flying out the buildings like they're paper. For New Yorkers who witnessed the catastrophe, there was no doubt for an instant that it was terrorism. It was too nice a day to, for that to be an accident. We were just talking amongst ourselves. You knew the plane hadn't gotten lost. Not, not a day like today, first thing. It was a beautiful day. How does a plane hit a building on a beautiful day like that? Firefighters working at the center of the attack describe a scene of overwhelming devastation. Pieces of bodies in the streets and in the rubble. Rescuers climbed the girders of the shattered building searching for any sign of life, but there were precious few. Many firefighters and officers were wounded or killed when the first responders were caught in the collapse of the towers. One police officer told us, no one has ever seen anything like this unless they were in Dresden in World War II. Horrible, horrible. The whole, no, no, no. the whole building just collapsed on us inside the lobby. One block from the base of the World Trade Center tower, the inferno burned four hours after the attack. Police cars, the first to respond, were incinerated by the collapse of the second tower. Many firefighters and officers were wounded in the collapse, perhaps killed. No one can say how many. No idea how many people and cops are dead. We have many people hurt. What about the casualties? What have you seen? Uncountable. Let's go, let's go. Courageous firefighters responded from all over New York City, called from off-duty, called from vacation. Rene Davila was the first EMS supervisor at the scene. I was there. And I saw the building collapse. We all started running. And I, I, and I, I ended up inside the Hilton somewhere. I was like trapped. I don't know where I was. I, I couldn't find my way out with all the smoke and the debris in there. I finally just closed the door behind me and covered it so no more smoke and debris would come in. And what I did was I called my wife. I told her I love her. Another. Hours after the attack, many smaller explosions rumbled through downtown. Yeah. Firemen, paramedics, and police officers walked out of the carnage in shock and disbelief. It was unbelievable. And, uh, this guy's still trapped. We couldn't get to him. Anybody want to volunteer? Many New Yorkers rushed downtown to volunteer. These construction workers were from Iron Workers Local 40. What's the job in there? Whatever it is. Whatever it is. To save somebody, one person saved, is a life saved. Through the day, an inferno raged in World Trade Center building number seven, another massive office tower. Firefighters feared that it would collapse. And a little more than eight hours after the attack, the abandoned building fell. 47 stories in the street. This is what's left of the carefully organized files and lives that were the World Trade Center. Bits of paper blasted into the street, construction dust an inch or two inches deep everywhere you look. What's eerie about this place now, several hours after the initial disaster, is just how quiet it is. You don't hear any ambulances racing away from the World Trade Center anymore. I saw many injuries. Hundreds, thousands. My eyesight did not see hundreds and thousands. I know that my heart and my brain tells me they were hundreds. 60 Minutes 2 correspondent Scott Pelley. This calamity is the most devastating terrorist attack ever waged against the United States. One is tempted to say ever waged anywhere, but certainly ever waged against the United States knife-wielding hijackers aboard the aircraft. If they had other weapons, it's not known. It is known that on at least two of the planes, and believed to be on three of the planes, cell phone reports from the planes before they were crashed into the targets, uh, cell phone callers reported uh, that on at least two of the planes, and possibly three, that flight attendants uh, had been attacked uh, with knives. Uh, the twin 110-story towers of the World Trade Center 
each hit separately by hijacked airliners. It was, all this was witnessed on television screens across the world. And then another plane slammed into the Pentagon and a fourth plane, yet a fourth plane, crashed outside of Pittsburgh. These scenes played all over the world. In China, outer Mongolia, everywhere in the world, these pictures eventually played. President Bush said in an address to the nation tonight, today our nation saw evil. The president said thousands of lives were, quote, suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. Establishing the death toll could take weeks. The four airliners alone had 266 people at least, possibly as many as 285 aboard. There were no known survivors aboard those airliners. Officials put the number of dead and wounded at the Pentagon at about 100 or more. That's a quote from officials at the Pentagon, uh, with some firefighter reports suggesting that the death toll at the Pentagon could raise to 800. These pictures are from this morning at the World Trade Center. A union official in New York said he feared 300 firefighters who first reached the scene may have died in rescue efforts at the Trade Center. And the head of the fire department in New York City said later that some 300 firefighters were missing, and that the hope was that eventually uh, uh, many of those uh, would be found. But we do know that there were heavy casualties among New York City firefighters especially, and some 30-some-odd police were missing, and some other police were known to be dead. New York City's uh, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani said, and I quote, the number of casualties will be more than most of us can bear. He was talking about when the final toll comes in. Uh, police uh, deep into this night and in the early morning were reporting uh, some calls from people with their cell phones trapped in debris, calling for help and hoping that rescue workers could somehow get to them. And on and on uh, the reports go. I think probably the most important thing to know at this moment in terms of, of what's happening on the lower end of Manhattan is that they, they have lights. It's getting organized down there, been organized for some time. They're going through with everything from bulldozers and cranes to pickaxes and shovels. Uh, in this scene, this is a live picture uh, looking south on Manhattan Island. And down there, amidst all that smoke, uh, they're trying to find people still alive in the debris, try, still trying to pull out uh, dead bodies. Uh, the collection of the dead, uh, the pulling out of the dead, will go on for certainly days and perhaps weeks. Now, it's coming up on the 2 o'clock hour here in New York City and in Washington, D.C., the morning after. Let's go again to CBS News Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts. John? Uh, Dan, the morning after, and uh, there is your morning headline, not uh, quite as blaring as the headlines that Mark Phillips was showing us from London, a little more matter-of-fact. Terrorists hijack four airliners, two destroy World Trade Center, one hits Pentagon, fourth crashes. But, Dan, this is an indication, as will be indicated in newspapers across the country this morning, that the world at least as far as the United States knows, it has dramatically changed and, and changed forever. Uh, a question that was being asked by many of my colleagues and myself tonight was, what next? How do we approach this? How do you even get on an airliner and have a reasonable expectation that it's going to land where it says it's going to land? How can you ever look at a plane flying over New York City ever again and wonder if it's going to go to its destination or if it's going to go somewhere else? Those are some of the fears that the president was trying to allay tonight in his speech from the Oval Office to be, to be reassuring to the nation and resolute in his determination to bring whoever was responsible for this act of terrorism to the bar of justice, whether it be the bar of justice in a courtroom or the bar of justice at the hands of the U.S. military, yet to be determined, Dan. But uh, certainly uh, both of those options are on the table. And uh, to a large degree, uh, while New York was so terribly affected by this, this is going to definitely change the tone in Washington as well. Uh, the Republicans and Democrats had been gearing up for a battle over the budget and Social Security and the economy. Uh, Dan, tonight everyone is standing in solidarity behind the president, giving him their full support as he proceeds with the investigation of these heinous acts of terrorism and to identify those responsible. Uh, we saw today uh, the, act, act, the uh, activity around the emergency action plan uh, that goes in, into place when there is a threat against uh, the government of the United States and the president. The president was in, in Sarasota, Florida. 
Uh, it, it was determined that there was uh, too much of a threat in Washington for him to come back straight away. That was the uh, act of terrorism on the Pentagon and a potential threat against the White House that precipitated that. He traveled to Barksdale Air, Air Force Base in uh, Louisiana, then from there on to Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, where he actually went down into a Strategic Air Command bunker and teleconference with his uh, National Security Council uh, determined that it was safe for him to come back uh, to Washington, D.C., and then with uh, three fighters, two F-15s and one F-16 flying off the wing of Air Force One, uh, made his way back to Andrews and then back to the White House. Dan, it, it should be said that this is, this is really going to be a test of this young presidency at, at moments like this this is why the united states has a president uh, a man who must or a woman who must absolutely take the reins of power a uh, person who must hold in their hands the confidence of the nation and uh, must be able to say with absolute confidence themselves that the nation will pull itself out of the grief and devastation that has been wrought upon it by these terrorists Dan? indeed john robertson john as you know i spoke earlier this evening with gary sick Gary Sick was an advisor and, uh, to President Carter, uh, President Reagan. Uh, he's been an advisor through several U.S. presidential administrations, uh, high up uh, on the NSC, the National Security Council, director of the Middle East Institute now at Columbia University. He is, uh, in short, one of the ranking experts on this kind of problem in our country. I asked Gary Sick what kind of planning went into this attack. If you simply stop and think about the magnitude of this operation, they were able to penetrate security in two major airports, get people on board, provide their own pilots, because they obviously had their own pilots to do. Suicide pilots. Suicide pilots, but pilots who were qualified to fly a, a major airplane. And I personally watched the second plane go into the trade towers, and there was no flinching and no swerving. He flew right straight into it, and it was clear that no American pilot, uh, no commercial pilot would ever have done that. And you stop and think about the amount of time, back it up, how much time was, would have been required, and the money, and the organization. Let's put it this way. What if you're the president in the Cold War days and you tell the CIA that you'd like to uh, create a little operation in Russia which would basically uh, hijack four airplanes and within a period of an hour crash them into major sites in the Soviet Union and you had to organize that. It would have stretched our capabilities absolutely to the limit and yet that's what happened here today. Reporters are always trained to follow the dollar, look for the money. Who finances an operation like this took a lot of money. It took money and it took professionalism. I personally think that this had to have had a professional organization behind it. Uh, if you look at the kind of operations that Osama bin Laden and others have conducted in the past, the most sophisticated stuff they've been able to manage is a car bomb. And car bombs are dangerous and they're deadly, but they aren't like what we saw today. And this business of organizing, they had to recruit in the United States. They had to have Americans. They had to have some way of passing through the security uh, in this country. That meant money, but it meant tremendous organization. And the fact that all of this, if you stop and think about it, it's amazing, went unreported, unnoticed by any of our systems, which were watching all of these specific organizations, raises the question, were we looking in the right place? Well, let's pursue that question. Whom do you think may be responsible for this? You know, I really don't want to speculate because I think it's, at this stage it's a pure guess. Everybody is speculating about Osama bin Laden. Maybe so. But if so, he has moved his operations to a level that this is the most, the largest and most successful terrorist operation in history. And he was simply not up to that. He had a, a bomb in a boat, and he had some car bombs outside embassies. This is far beyond This that is something of an... And it's in this country. Well, let We're me not ask talking question, about East Africa. Africa. I know you don't want to speculate, and neither do I, but it's inevitable that these questions flow on. That if it was or was not Osama bin Laden, you've said it was well-financed, it was exceptionally right. well-planned, a very sophisticated and large operation. Uh, if, you, if the president asks you, what are the chances, <laughs> Gary, say, that Saddam Hussein or one of the radical mullah groups in Iran were responsible, would you root it out? Saddam Hussein today said that this was the operation of the century. And there was great celebrations in Baghdad, not in Iran. But, you know, if you had to look for a culprit in terms of organization, structure, money, professionalism, all of the things that go with it, 
that's one place that you would certainly have to look. And I think that our intelligence services are going to have to do a really careful step back from the, where they've been looking and start looking under some different rocks because I think there are some things going on that we haven't really observed. We have only a few seconds left here, but we spend billions of dollars on intelligence. Does this or any other president have the will to zero base our, our whole intelligence operations? No, but it, intelligence works when you're looking in the right place, and I've seen it the Israelis in 1973 and elsewhere had the information, but they didn't know what to do with it. They were looking in the wrong way, and they thought they knew what was going on, and they interpreted it wrongly. I think that we need to step back from it and take a hard look at our interpretation of the information that we probably already got. Gary Sick, thank you very much. You Gary Sick, now of Columbia University, formerly advisor to several presidents. There were many scenes of heroism and horror in the Twin Towers attacks here in New York City. CBS's Lee Cowan reports on the people in the streets amid rubble and chaos. I caution you in advance, the pictures are graphic. For those inside the World Trade Center, it wasn't just hell on earth. For Bob Fox, it was hell 39 stories up. It was unbelievable. I was on the 39th floor about quarter to nine when a tremendous explosion hit. Those lucky enough to get out walked out of one danger right into another. A moonscape of ash and debris, smoke and fire, leaking gas, and already the smell of death. Debris, smoke, the roll of dust, everything, just couldn't see nothing. And I was praying to God then that, uh, <laughs> let me get by this now. Iron worker Tony Cabrera rushed toward the carnage to try and help. Then I seen a second plane hit. I went into this lobby. And I went into the lobby. I was there with the fire department and everything, and just it was starting to give away this and that pieces of people coming down, parts and whatever. Never seen anything like it. Never. Rescuers were at a loss. Smoke so thick they couldn't see the damage. The clamor of falling debris so loud they couldn't hear the cries for help. All of it made worse when the first of the twin towers came tumbling down upon them. After the first series of explosions, there was hardly time to get in, and those that did were right in line of fire for the next series of explosions. As the second tower collapsed, Val Coleman had a front row seat to disaster, watching it all unfold out of his apartment window just five blocks away. And a great blossom of flame, a huge red fireball, scared the hell out of me. Val Coleman was inside the World Trade Center just 15 minutes before the initial attack and remembers the last person he talked with. A very nice young man answered me very politely. I left, came back here, and boom, he's probably dead. And as he sat watching the building burn, Coleman could see tiny black specks near the top floors. They were people jumping off instead of being burned alive. There must, I must have seen 10 or 15 people come down, one after off another. Off the top? Off what appeared to be the top. The bombings today brought one horrific scene after another. Rescuers know once they get closer to what's left of the Twin Towers, the images are sure to get worse. And indeed, they have gotten worse. And tonight, under the Klieg lights, the search goes on in Lower Manhattan. The search goes on for anyone who may still be alive in the debris. Mayor Giuliani, for one, and others in the police department are convinced that some people may still be alive in the debris down there. And the search goes on for bodies. And the efforts continue to put out the last remaining fires to deal with the smoke and the wobbly buildings in and around the World Trade Center itself. Members of the U.S. Congress say that they will be back at work in the morning after a day that saw the Capitol building evacuated and the first ever use of an emergency plan to put the congressional leadership out of harm's way in a secret location. Uh, Chief National Security Correspondent, uh, David Martin contributed to this story, and our chief Washington correspondent, Bob Schieffer, has more on how Washington reacted to its confrontation with terrorism. Tonight, in an incredible show of bipartisan resolve, hundreds of members of Congress gathered on the steps of the Capitol to say these acts of terrorism will not stand, the government will continue to operate, and Congress will continue to function and that the two parties will come together to support the president. When American suffers, and when people perpetrate acts against this country, we as a Congress and as a government stand united, and we stand together. We will speak with one voice, 
to condemn these attacks, to comfort the victims and their families, to commit our full support to the effort to bring those responsible to justice. It was a kind of thing seldom seen here, and in a touching close, they literally sang the praises of their country. God bless America, my home sweet home. Earlier today, that's Bob Schieffer's report from Washington. Earlier today and then again tonight, I had a chance to discuss the day's tragic events and what they may mean with former U.S. National Security Advisor Sandy Berger. Give us some context and perspective on what's happened here today. Dan, I think this is a watershed event uh, that has taken place today. Uh, this is a massive escalation, both in capacity and intent, of the terrorist assault on the United States. And I think that it means we enter a now an entirely new phase. I think it's extremely important that we stand uh, behind the president uh, at this stage because there's not going to be a simple and swift uh, solution to this. This is, will take a sustained, concerted, long-term effort uh, to, uh, uh, to reverse this. I, I believe we will know sooner rather than later who is responsible. I think this is so sophisticated and there's so many pieces here that both with respect to the physical evidence and the intelligence that we will know uh, before long who is responsible, but there's no magic bullet, uh, literally or figuratively, uh, that will take care of this. This is going to take a sustained, determined effort uh, uh, by the American people supporting the president because uh, we're in for the long haul here. Sandy Berger, you were there. You were in the room when the decision was made in 1998. After two American embassies in East Africa, had been attacked by terrorists with great loss of life, including American life. Some version of that meeting has to be held at some point with this new President Bush administration. Take us into that kind of meeting. What are the options a president has? Well, I think it's useful to think about this almost in two uh, pieces, Dan. First of all, uh, an, earth an earthquake has struck New York and Washington today. Uh, there are victims. Uh, there's still people in those buildings. Uh, so in the first instance, obviously, this is still a rescue relief operation. Second of all, it's a button-down security operation. And I think the, administ and the administration has made very clear today by their actions that they've secured other potential targets. Uh, and Sandy Berger went on to say, of course, the president will be asking for the latest information from intelligence agencies and then reviewing his options based on that information. The attack on America was an attack first and foremost on powerful symbols of America. CBS News correspondent Richard Schlesinger has more on what these symbols represent and why they were targets. Oh my God! It didn't take long for the images of this sneak attack on the United States to remind people of another one, December 7, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. Pearl Harbor is one of the first things that comes to mind. Evan Kornog is a Columbia University historian and journalist. After Pearl Harbor, there was the Japanese fleet to go after. One knew th where to find the enemy. Uh, here, it's a much more complicated issue. Pearl Harbor was an attack on the U.S. Navy, a symbol of American power at the time. Today's attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center struck at modern symbols of American power and prestige. Those towers are saying, look at us, we're important. And somebody has come along and said, you're not as important as you think. The pictures of the destruction are destined to become images for the ages. The image of that airplane crashing into the side of the building, the image of the collapsing towers, those are going to be things that, that just stay riveted in our memories. Like the flag at Iwo Jima. You see those pictures and a whole era and a whole set of issues is called to mind. And I think uh, we haven't yet seen, don't know yet what all the defining images of this event are going to be. But uh, they're going to be there in our memories as long as we live. The symbolism of this attack was impossible to ignore overseas. 
And the feeling is uh, that throughout the world, the Americans are not as powerful as they were thought to be. Therefore, these terrorists were really going to achieve a symbolic victory. But officials here in New York and in Washington know the difference between a symbolic victory and a real victory. When the World Trade Center was brought to the ground, the country was brought to its knees. But terrorism experts say just for a while. For years, authorities have practiced for attacks like today's, many times under the direction of Jerome Hauer, who was an emergency management official in New York. You have to plan for the worst. Uh, that's just, uh, particularly in a city like in New York, in Washington, D.C., the real thing is never like a drill. The enormity of the situation today is just... Uh, uh, is, is just incredible. Did the bad guys win today? They got, they got that image. They got well. They certainly our attention. struck a blow today. There's no question about it. Um, uh, but uh, the, our, uh, you know, we are a very resilient uh, nation, and uh, we are very resilient people. And we're a very different people than we were just before nine o'clock this morning when this all began. Oh, God, Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, New York. And so from out of the skies, tragedy has rained down on our nation. It was swift, deliberate, terrifying, but also galvanizing. In a matter of moments, in one city, a towering American icon was destroyed, and in another, the greatest symbol of our national military strength was set ablaze. What once seemed unthinkable has happened. On a bright summer morning, under a clear and cloudless sky, terror struck. The toll has been devastating. It may be days or even weeks before the final accounting is done. To grasp the enormity of it is almost too much for the heart to bear. This night, this morning, we can only look back in sorrow at a world that has suddenly, perhaps irrevocably, been changed. In days and years to come, we will look at the calendar and remember September 11th, 2001. It is a date now etched in our history, engraved in stone, and unforgettable. The day of the attack on America. We leave you tonight with these images, flashpoints, from a day that will not, cannot be forgotten. What's what the hell was that? I saw the plane hit the building. I can't say anything. Morning! Morning! Thank you. I've never seen nothing like it in my life. Wait a second. This is, is this a live picture? This is a live picture. We are seeing the second World Trade Tower Center. World Trade Center Tower Number One has just collapsed, ladies and gentlemen. You see it live in our picture. Just keep backing up. just started running for the door. Everybody right was trapped. Nine, Eventually, three, when the dust lifted, I saw some light and started screaming for everybody to go out towards the light. There was tons of company given May days. We lost tons of guys. It was unbelievable. In I feel for the families. I just feel bad for the families. And our thoughts and prayers are with those families who have lost loved ones today. CBS News from our world headquarters in New York will continue continuous round-the-clock coverage. Much, if not all, of it will be carried on many, if not all, of these CBS stations. Now, for those of you on the West Coast, your local news will follow immediately, and then CBS News coverage will pick up after that uh, through the night. Melissa McDermott will be up next to bring you the latest over the next few hours. There'll be a special expanded edition of the early show starting one hour early. 
The CBS Early Show will start at 6 a.m. Eastern Time, 3 a.m. Pacific, and CBS News coverage will continue throughout the day Wednesday. Dan Rather, CBS News, New York.